from here? So, do your neighbors know that you're a dead boy? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Good question. <coughs> Whenever you guys are ready. Oh, here we are. All right. Hi, this is Jeff Redding, and uh, we're here in uh, Hermitage, Pennsylvania, just on the other side of Youngstown, Ohio. And we're talking with Frank Sesich. Hello! <laughs> who, uh, as you're going to find out, has a very rich history. So, Frank, to start out, let's jump into the Wayback Machine and uh, go back to 1969 and talk about Blue Ash and the formation of the band. Um, one of the first power pop bands? Yeah, it, 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 yeah, probably in the world. Us and the Badfinger, uh, we were even together before the Raspberries, about a year before them. So um, Jim Kenzer and I from Sharon here uh, started the band. We were been in band since we were in junior high, and uh, we started Blue Ash the summer of 1969. We we're together for 10 years. Had two albums out, uh, one on Mercury Records and one on Playboy, and we were signed by the same guy who signed the New York Dolls, the Mercury Paul Nelson. Well, that's pretty cool. And you had a, a few minor hits, and, yeah. and I know that that. Um, the, the Blue Ash records are really popular in Europe. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, as yeah, you've been over yeah. in Spain, it's like really huge. Yeah, over we there. toured Spain all over last summer, and it was great because we have two Spanish labels over there that put out our things, and we were on national radio, uh, Radio 3, El Satano show at, at drive time, and played live with acoustic guitar sponsored by Gibson. Of, oh, that's pretty uh, cool. Of, of Spain, so we did a live show at drive time. Broadcast all over the entire country, so it was pretty cool. Was was Blue Ash always intended to be a power pop band, or yeah, well, were you trying to go for like that garagey, psychedelic kind of sound that was going on? When, at we, that time? when we started, there was a lot of like boogie jam bands like uh, that were going on, and, uh, and we didn't like that heavy metal started coming out and that, and it just wasn't our thing. We didn't like the singer songwriters either. We always liked the songs from the, the '60s, the Who, the Hollies, the Beatles, Stones. So when we started writing our own originals, we wanted to have an original band in 69. We wrote in that kind of vein, and that's how it kind of happened, except we had martial lamps. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a little... Uh, a little yeah, bit of the heavy metal side there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but with pop songs, so I guess that's how the power pop started with all those bands. Right. Yeah. Um, so... Um, Tell us about the Freakout Club, where you debuted in '69. The Freakout was a great place. It was over in. Um, uh, I'll, I'll take you there this afternoon. But we, it's it started out over between Gerard and Niles at McKinley Heights. Then it burned down, and then they moved it to Youngstown. That was in '68. It started in '69. It was there, but it was a wildly painted psychedelic place, and uh, it was great because they'd have. I mean, you could go on a Wednesday night, and James Gang were like the regular band there. Or, you know, Glass Harp, or uh, the Pied Pipers, Human Beings, all those bands played their Left End, um, Blue Ash, we, we, us and Left End, that was our home, that's where we uh, rehearsed and everything. So it was a great club to play. So, as you said, you put out two albums, um, although I understand that there are rumors that there are many, many live bootlegs out there. Of you, of you guys there's from all period. kind of blue ash things out everywhere there's the the uh, one of the more famous ones bootlegs was done by my friend uh, uh, Mike McKay he did it on a cassette recorder when we played with raspberries at, at Packard Music Hall it has like 3,000 kids were there that was a great one but there's tapes all over the place blue ash when we put out uh, the around again album in 2004 not lame there was uh, 219 tapes I had found at Peppermint Productions that we had done. And those were studio tapes, not live, I mean just studio tapes. So that's what compromises most of the things that are out in Spain now on the Hearts and Arrows album. And, all and you had to go through all of that material to come up with 44 songs to come out with yeah. around again. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that yeah. must have been a project and a half. Yeah, and... oh yeah, just, I still have, I have tons of things downstairs that I have never even listened to. I just... I bet the memories came flooding oh, back yeah, immediately yeah. as soon as you heard them. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you'd never even remember writing a song like that. Yeah. Why Why did the band end up breaking up and after the, the album in 77? Well, after the album in 77, and we got a really good shot of making it then. We sold over 54,000 copies of that, and Playboy went out of business. So, I mean, it, by the, that had just taken all the wind out of ourselves. And right around that time, uh, Stu was coming around a lot. He was coming back here a lot and wanted to start doing... Power popping, he's like, hey, came up and let's record it. It's cold. And so, I said, that'd be great. Yeah. So we went up to Kirk Yano's studio and Jimmy Zero Blitz and I and Stiff recorded the first demos of that. I don't know if anybody knows that. The demos are real cool. I'm trying to find those. And then Stiff took them to uh, uh, 
L.A. and played him for Greg Shaw, and he signed us up. Immediately wanted to do it. Well, that's pretty yeah. cool. Um, did you do much after that before joining the Dead Boys, or was it? Because I know that this would have been in like '78. We started doing that, and then right in early January or so of '79, Stiv called me, wanted me to come out to L.A. So I went out there, and there was going to be a big tour with this. Um, Dutch guy that was putting all these punk bands together. Cheetah and Gita came out. A lot of people came out, and and that sort of didn't happen. And then we uh, went with Bomb Records, and then Stiff, they, Cheetah and Stiff started booking some Dead Boys things, and they called me up and you know come up and rehearse. I guess Magnum didn't want to do it, so I played with the original band, and then I played off and on for uh, the next year and a half with them. I played about 100 gigs with them, you know, with the Dead Boys. And then, you know, Cheetah broke his, his, his wrist at, at Keith Richards' uh, birthday party. The so skating we, party, yeah. The skating uh, party. So, so then, then we, uh, we had a whole tour, so we got, asked George Cavanis to go with us from uh, Hamburg Damage. So is, is that what led to the original breakup then? Was it was after the accident? Or was it already They had already been broken up, and then they got back together, and then I guess Jeff didn't want to do it, so Stivic called me. And then, then we just started mixing the... The Stiv Bader stuff with the Dead Boy stuff, and, and just did gigs till about 1981 when the Disconnected album came out, and Brian James came over and we did a tour with him. He joined the band, so it was like a, a weird thing. You know, mm -hmm. for about a month we toured all over New England, the Midwest, and everything. And the the, um, the winter, to December, when John Lennon was shot. I think that's where the day the Disconnected album came out. Actually, that Monday. Oh wow, that's <laughs> how weird heavy. is that? Yeah, <laughs> that's know. when it was released that day. Wow. So, but I remember um, Jeff Jones was our road manager. We, we had to play in New York about a week later, so he took us up to the Dakota building. And I remember me and Steve and Brian were there, and, and Jimmy, and there's just millions of flowers all over the place. It was a weird time, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah I can yeah, imagine yeah. it would be. Because I, rem I remember that period and, and everything. And, yeah. I mean, everybody was stunned for yeah. so long after that happened because, I mean, how could somebody shoot Well, I remember that, that, that night, uh, and, and Blitz called me when it happened. I think we talked all night. And he was up in Toronto or something. But I think we talked for like six or seven hours just through the night, just talking. It was like one of those mind-blowing uh, lifetime things that happens, you know? Yeah. That was crazy. So um, so Front Page News came out in 77, and I noticed in the liner notes that um, one of your world influences was Stiv. Yeah. And so how and when did you actually meet him originally? I met him in 1967, and I was I was like 15 or 16, and he was he's a couple years older than me. You know, he was two years older than me. But I had met him at um, a house where a lot a lot of long-haired guys used to hang out, at hippie types, uh, over in uh, at the college, you know, at Youngstown, and we we would go to to. Um, dances and stuff like that. They had carousel teen clubs. I'll show you one of those places today too. But we, we would just hang out and there's a whole group of us that hung out. Mike Miller who was uh, 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 the Mother Goose uh, manager. Um, uh, Karen Wagner Carruthers who passed away. Like She was Steve's girlfriend in high school. Great girl. You met Johnny up in Cleveland. That's her, that's her son. Okay. Johnny Carruthers. But there was a whole bunch of us to hang out. My girlfriend, Joanne Rose at the time, Marty Magner from Mother Goose. And that's kind of how the Mother Goose connection came, too. Since I quit Mother Goose to uh, join um, Blue Ash, Steve was kind of my replacement. I was like the, the bass player, kind of lead singer of the band. And then when they, they reformed and got him in the band, they were more theatrical thing then. Okay, so um, Steve said in 86 when we interviewed him, mm -hmm. And he was talking about um, a blues band that he played in. And I asked Cheetah about it yesterday, and he said that that was a stiff story. So he actually was? Or was it more of a garage no, type band? No, Mother Goose was more of a theatrical Alice Cooper type band. They did things, but still, it was always like they would bring Karen out, and his girlfriend is the sacrificial virgin, and they would like, <laughs> have her on a tray or something. I don't know. I have a film I'll have to show. I, I told Danny about it. I'll have to uh, get it to him. And if I can get permission from the guy who took it, it's the famous old Mother Goose film. It, it's terrific. Stiv used to bring it around and show it everywhere. It's like eight minutes long, but it's silent, and it'll give you a good clue of it. 
But uh, yeah, but they kind of did things like that. The first, I brought Stiv on stage, I must, in this, before Blue Ash was actually together, it was me, Steve Acker, I don't know if you know Acker, he played in a band called Law that was on MCA Records, and um, Goog Goo Yendrick from uh, Blue Ash, and Myron Grumbacher, who played with Pat Benatar. Mm -hmm. I got a pickup band for this little festival that was out in Newton Falls, and it got Stiv as the lead singer, and I brought him on stage for the first time, it was early 69 or so. And he did his thing, but the funny thing was he, we did like Stray Cat Blues and some Stooges songs and things like that. He brought a can of whipped cream out, and he was shaking it in his crotch here. <laughs> And she should sit all over. I thought, this guy's nuts. <laughs> Cause I, and, there's, and people were going crazy, but they took a mic stand and threw it in the air, and it came down, clipped him in the head, and took a big gash out of his head. So the whipped cream, he, this was all mixing with the blood, and it's like this pinkish orange kind of thing all over. He looks like this monster from hell. And the people just went crazy. I ended up taking him to the emergency room to get stitched up. And was he, that the night that he stuck his head in the in the bass drum? He might have done that there too. I can't remember. Because because yeah. I heard I heard yeah. something about that that yeah. he was all bloody yeah. because of an accident with a microphone yeah, or something, yeah, yeah, and yeah, he stuck his head like right in the and kick I thought, drum. Wow, this guy's crazy. But that was <laughs> but he used to come to a lot of the Blue Ash gigs. Then Jeff Jones. Jones always got like Mother Goose to open up for us, different versions of it. So they must have played you know, Underbill with us 25 times or so. Was so that, that was kind of um, um, the precursor? Be then he went to uh, Cleveland and, and started Frankenstein that with you know Blitz and, and Cheetah and all. That. How did how did Left End kind of fit into that? Was well, that part of that whole scene? Yeah, Left End, but they were just part of the whole scene. Dennis Sasansky was the. Uh, uh, lead singer of the Pied Pipers. Dennis and, the Menace. Yeah, Dennis, then it became Dennis the Menace, then uh, Left End all, all you know, came from di different soul bands and stuff like that. And it all kind of mixed together. It's all kind of incestuous. Because <laughs> they kind of seem to be almost pre-punk in a way, too, oh, yeah, yeah. A, a, with a lot of their attitude. I mean, they were more of a rock band, yeah. not what we would consider to be punk today, yeah, yeah. but yet they kind of had that sort of yeah. bad boy attitude Yeah, it was that, that Youngstown thing going. <laughs> yeah. so, so what was it like touring with the Stooges at that time? Uh, it, it was crazy. We did quite a few jobs with them. We played, one was in, in uh, the Oregon Ballroom in Chicago, it had been 73, right around my birthday in June, and that was really crazy. We played with the, the band Detroit and, uh, uh, and the Stooges, and that was a weird place because it has the weirdest acoustics in the world. But the most famous one we did was um, February 9th, 1974, the, the Metallic A.O. concert. We, we were the opening band right before the Stooges. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that was pretty crazy. And that that was, and we, we knew it was coming because you could tell it was coming all night. The audience was crazy. And there was like 4,000 people. There was Michigan Palace. It was back. Blue Ash never sounded better in our lives. My favorite great gig we ever played. We, and we always sold a lot of records in L in Detroit, so it was cool. We got a lot of airplay. But when Iggy came on, we just stood at the side of the stage because we knew how crazy it was. And they had, to, they had to literally carry him out, you know. And he, you know, you've heard all the things that happened. But the funniest part was we left one of our guitars, Jim Kenzer's uh, Epiphone uh, Sheraton, on stage. And after the, after the gig, it was the crazy, and the Stooges never played again for 29 years. That was the last gig, you know. And, and there was, they started throwing eggs and ice and beer cans and everything. But there were egg splatters all over Jim's guitar, you know? Like yellow splattered egg, and it just dried it. Jim never took it off. He still has that guitar. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's 43 <laughs> years ago, right? And the egg splatters are still on there. Because <laughs> it was such a classic night. <laughs> they just stuck on the thing. That's he crazy. would even play it with those egg splatters on. So that's pretty, that's my funny story from that night. So so, talking about record sales, yeah. Blue Ash never really sold a lot of records. No, no, I know no. It, it might be kind of a sensitive subject. No, uh, well, the first album we had to sell twenty five thousand to make a second album. We sold nineteen thousand five hundred. The guys in the A and R department loved us. The promo guys hated us in Turkey. So there was this big war, and we got one more single. And if that didn't make it, we would be dropped, you know, how they drop you from the labels. And even Dick Clark tried to make it a hit, but played it on American Bandstand and everything, but we we couldn't do it, so we were dropped from the label. Then a lot of other labels were really interested in us, Columbia, RCA, and we flew up and did uh, things for them. And something at the last minute would always fall through. And Nemperor Records, who Nat Weiss on, with the Romantics run and a bunch of different people, jazz guys, but he was... Uh, uh, the Beatles' American Lawyer, Brian Epstein's friend. Okay. That's where uh, 
John uh, Lennon, well, Paul McCartney met, hung out with his wife when they did the, uh, the Johnny Carson show in New York. They stayed at Nat's apartment. So he was a cool guy. Spent a whole weekend with us. He was going to sign us and then fell through. So we eventually got to with Playboy, which was on CBS, which was a lot of our CBS connections helped promote that too. So that album, the Playboy album, actually sold about 55,000 copies. It seems kind of strange to me because when, when I listen to like the, the, mm -hmm. the first album or whatever, yeah. you know, it's very contemporaneous to what was going on yeah. at that yeah. time yeah. and bands that had hits mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, sure. And it doesn't... Like Slade or bands like that, yeah, it fit right in. Yeah, yeah it doesn't make sense that, that well, Blue Ash wouldn't have... Well, we had, we had regional hits. We were, we were big in Miami, we were big in Detroit, we were big in Boston, but we couldn't break like LA and and, and 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 Los Angeles. And back then records would sell we you could have a hit in Texas in the South like we did with Look at You Now, all over the South and not have a national hit. And we were number one in dozens of different markets then. But it wouldn't break nationally. It's different now. It either goes all nationally or not. But back then they had a thing called regional hits. Mm -hmm. Like it's cold outside. That was when we were kids, me and Stiff that was a number one record here. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that that wasn't a hit all over the country. We had no idea because it was a hit here. Right. You know, it was a hit in Youngstown, Akron, and Cleveland. That was our world. Yeah, it was that Midwest sound. Yeah, it was you know, a Midwest Cleveland, sound. Cleveland, Detroit, yeah. Pittsburgh, yeah, yeah. Chicago, it was, Buffalo. Yep, exactly. Whole... Exactly. And it was it would break in regions. So, um, over the years, there've been kind of number of different reunions that mm -hmm. that Blue Ash has done, and yeah. now you got it reconstituted, you just did some recordings, some yeah. material, um, how is that coming along, when is that going to be released? Well, we, we've started on a new Blue Ash album, the first one, it'll be in, in, in 40 years, and um, it, it's sounding great, we're doing it over at Amprion, and the, the Deadbeat Poets crew that toured with uh, Blue Ash, uh, uh, Pete Revere, who owns Amprion, uh, John Lemmick and John Corey of the Deadbeat Poets, and it's me and Jim Kenzer who are the nucleus of, of the Blue Ash. A lot of we're doing some old songs we've never recorded before. We got some brand new ones like Cousin Dickie Shirt and My She's My Car. Actually, it's coming on great. So what what it looks like is going to happen is I've been talking to some labels in Europe and we're going to do a two sided album. Um, uh, one's going to be Deadbeat Poets, six songs on it, vinyl, and the other half Blue Ash. So if we go on tour, we'll take both bands. Both together. bands. Kind of like Par Parliament Funkadelic. Right, right, right. They used to come out as the Parliament in the suits and do the 60s. I want to testify, then they'd switch over and do this psychedelic stuff. Yeah, cool guys. Cool. They actually came to see Blue Ash play. That's how we got to tour Canada from their road manager. They stopped in in Youngstown one time and um, they were playing Stamp Auditorium or something. We were playing an after prom at uh, the Voyager Inn and they heard all this music and came up. Of course, the kids were thrilled with Parliament Funk and Dalek showed up at their prom. You know? Oh, yeah. I and imagine. they were jamming. We, we hung out and then their their, uh, uh, their road manager really liked us. He was a bookie agent to him, booked us all over Canada. So it was kind of cool. So, um, another probably source uh, topic, um, Bill Bartolin, your yeah, yeah. songwriting partner and guitarist. Yeah, he passed away in, in, in October of 2009. He had cancer and uh, they, they really, uh, on Labor Day, discovered it and he died a month later. You know? and it was a terrible loss. Uh, still real close with his son and, and his, his, uh, his, ex, his uh, widow, uh, Darla. But, uh, yeah, it's just terrible. I would known him since I was a little kid, you know. So. Yeah, as I noticed that, um, it, that it, at least on uh, Front Page News, yeah. that the two of you yeah. wrote all the songs oh, together. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, definitely. So, we so you were pretty much the team Songwriting team. Yeah, we did that. Jim would write on his own and everything. but uh, And he, Jim and I are writing a couple new ones together on the new album. But, yeah, on Front Page News, no more no less, we wrote all the songs for the part one. So we mentioned around again. Yeah. Um, what's the story with the alternate around again? Oh, that, this is so fun. These guys were called uh, the Power Pop Criminals, and they were out of like a little country in between Spain and uh, uh, France called Andorra. It's huh? up in up in the Pyrenees Mountains, and they would put out all these bootlegs all the time. And then, uh, uh, but I, which I thought was great, they would put out blue ash bootlegs and when stuff was around and. And a lot of people were mad at him for putting out bootlegs. And I said, you know, I, I don't care if you guys put out stuff. I said, 
you know, Mercury Records has had this, been sitting on that for 40 years, and they've never put it out. So you're doing more to, to help me than they are. So they thought it was kind of cool. So they, then they, when that came up, they even bootlegged that the pop, the uh, pop, around, alternate around again and put like 10 different songs on it from different bootlegs from Blue Ash. So they were kind of cool. They're still around. They they keep changing their names. Power Pop Lovers, Power Pop Criminals, and. And they're probably not even from Andorra, they're probably from Russia, you know, so I have no idea. <laughs> Things keep coming out all over the place, so. That sounds cool. So, all right, so let's just focus and, and let's talk about Stiv a little sure. bit. So, um, so you knew Stiv for a real long time. Yeah, yeah, um, I met him when I was about 15. So, what can you tell us about his younger days, his family, Stephen Marion, yeah. his parents were always very supportive of him and the bands that he was in. And things and, and yeah, I was, like my dad worked at the steel mill, so did Stiv's dad over in Youngstown. Even Stiv worked there for a while, went into the mills, but he hated it. Came home and told his dad one day, "Cause I just, you know, I can't do this." And his dad was always real supportive. His dad sung; too. he was a singer, and, and uh, they were always very supportive. Two of the nicest people you ever want to meet. Yes. You know, well, I had so many fun times over at that hospital. Always hospitable and, and, and just great people. Stiff, it, a very normal, uh, he was an only child, you know, so very normal uh, Catholic upbringing. Went to St. Rose School, St. Rose Church, and then Ursuline High School, which is the big uh, Catholic school mm -hmm. of all of Youngstown there and probably all northeastern Ohio. It's a very contemporaneous uh, uh, up, upbringing. He, it, contemporaneous, I mean, he went with a lot of crazy people that went to that school. Ed O'Neill. From uh, married with children, mm -hmm. yeah, he was he was a couple grades ahead of Steve, you know, at the, in the same classes and everything. So um, very very normal like that. Uh, as a, he was always crazy like that, even as a teenager, you know. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention the, the the whole Catholic upbringing and everything. And uh -huh. Steve always said that his being an altar boy yeah. oh, led yeah. him down the path yeah. oh, that he yeah. ultimately yeah. took. Yeah. But it must have been a strange dynamic having that Catholic upbringing and then doing the kind of music that he was doing. What did his? How did his parents feel about that? Like at the beginning, I think they were they were always pretty supportive of it. You know, they always were. They were always at the gigs, even even the real early gigs, Mother Goose gigs and stuff like. That. They were always there. And as you know, the old Dead Boys gigs, they show up everywhere in Cleveland, mm -hmm. They were there all the time. He was real proud of them too. You know, mm -hmm. he was proud of his you know working class roots, and he was he, he was a good guy. They, they were very down to earth people, and he he just had that 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 that. Craziness and gleam in his eye, and his dad had that same same gleam, you know. Right. Yeah. And and yet, and well, probably as a result, his dad <laughs> couldn't deal with the steel mills. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which sure. which makes sense. So, yeah. um, well, okay. So in 1969, and so Steve was around 20, I guess. Yeah, yeah. At that been point, 20, did did age make much of a difference to him? Did he care about it at all? I, I don't think he really did. Because he always looked ten years younger than he was, mm -hmm. except in the real later, you know, uh, Lord's days. But even when I was playing with him in '79, '80, '80, he always looked—he looked like he was 22. He didn't look like, you know. So I don't think it bothered him that much. When you first met him, what were your first what, first impressions of him? Other than the fact that he was crazy. <laughs> first time I met him, it, like I said, it was this old house by well, these hippie and long hair people were hanging out and somebody had introduced me to him. Did he have long hair at that time? Yeah, he had long hair. And this girl walks down down the steps and I can't even remember her name was Kathy or something like that. And buckskin jacket, pretty you know, hippie girl and everything. And I had just met Steve fifteen seconds before this, right? He goes, Hey Kathy, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, this is Frank. He goes, he's never been laid before. <laughs> What is going on here? She goes, really? And I said, and I'm like flabbergasted because I just met this guy, you know? She goes, oh, okay. She goes, he's kind of cute. She's, I said, wait, wait a minute. Said, What's going on? So I, I didn't do it, but that's just the kind of guy he was. He would just set you up like that. Yeah. He's piss take, you know, all the time, you know? Then we became great friends after. But that's, that's my, oh, after, you know, shaking his hand, that's the next thing that happened to me. 
he doesn't even know me, right? Right. <laughs> He's trying to set me up, and it works, you know? <laughs> How oh, funny, yeah. I'd say he was. Uh, I've never he was told a that master, story. He was a master of timing. Yeah, yeah. He absolutely was a master yeah. of timing. What? Um, so, so, what was the general scene like at that time, or in the early seventies, uh, here in the Youngstown area? There were a lot of clubs. Uh, like in the late sixties and early seventies, there were the carousel teen clubs, which were everywhere. The freak out had a teen dance on Sunday afternoons, so you could go there. No, loose. You can go in there at any age. Everything was 18 and over, so there were a lot of clubs. It was three, two beer at 18. Right. So. But, I remember um, those days. <laughs> I mean, the freakout would be open from Wednesday through Sunday, you know? Mm -hmm. And there were clubs everywhere you could play every night of the week. There was a, a, a great band scene. So many great musicians came out. Just Youngstown were uh, Phil Kagi, Gary Markaski, who played with uh, uh, Coconut, and uh, uh, Michael Stanley, Myron Grumbacher. We were all friends. Uh, played with Pat Benatar and, mm -hmm. and Roger Lewis and other people later on. The Holes in Road were a great band. There were just there was a dozen great bands and probably two dozen great places to play around. So it was a really really thriving thriving scene. You can make a good living at it and and just play everywhere. Yeah, we already mentioned Left End. Human Beings was yeah, another you know, the, one. They well, were I, real big. I were at the freak out. I had this picture and I've got to find it because there were like. Um, um, at eight or nine guys in this picture, and we're all in there, and the picture was taken, shows everybody, and every single person in that picture later got signed to a different major label. And you know what the, the chances of that are? I mean, there are guys from Glass Harp who got signed, Decca, uh, Stiv, and, and and Dennis from uh, you know Left End, all these people, Markaski, Meyer, we're all in this picture, Steve Acker. Your chances of getting signed to a major label are about as, as, as good as your chances of getting signed to a major league baseball team. That's how rare that is. And there's nine of us in this picture that all went to different major labels out of Youngstown. How uh, crazy is that? That you know? is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. so the human beings then, yeah, I they mean, were, they probably, were, one of them was in the picture too, I think. They were, they were one of the precursors to power pop oh, yeah. as we know yeah. it today, and, and they kind of kind of sort of bridged the gap between power pop and the psychedelic garage stuff that uh, was going big on. Big influence on me was Ting Markle from there and I, I still got a picture in my mind of him leaning that Rick and Bacher against a dual showman, hitting a D chord on the fifth fret. <laughs> You're getting that feedback. That's what that is. That's how you get that. But I you know, we'd see them everywhere at all the record hops here and and he was a great idol of mine and Stiff's. We all loved Ting. Everybody loved Ting. And he was the rhythm guitar player in the band. But yeah, they had a worldwide hit, you know. Yeah. And he would come back, and they, he would regale us with stories about them in Japan. They were like the Beatles. He'd see all these little Oriental faces pressed against the limousines, <laughs> <laughs> screaming. <laughs> they were one of, one of my favorite bands yeah, from, yeah. from this yeah. area, from that period. Yeah. For sure. Um, that was really cool. Um, so, um, what, uh, <laughs> what's, what was the Desert Winnebago event? Well, that was, I was told, he brought me out to uh, L.A. to go on this tour with this crazy Dutchman that was a millionaire. I won't say his name because I can't even remember it, but he, he uh, uh, had all this money and still ran into him, of course. He goes, I ran into this guy, got all this money, he wants to put this tour on. So he had all these Winnebagas, and they were like, uh, everybody had their own, Steve and I, and, and Eddie Best was there, and different bands, and they, we rehearsed in this warehouse first in Alhambra. Then he took out, the tour was going to just stop at random cities across the United States. And he had a, uh, another big trailer that had 200 um, high speed duplicators. He was just going to give out free cassettes to anybody who came to the set. And this guy was all, all you know, coked up. And uh, uh, they had a lot. They, they, I don't know if I, I don't, where he got his money, I have no idea from. But he, he was supposedly this businessman that cashed it all in. And, and Steve, of course, uh, um, runs into him, but uh, um, they, they were, it was kind of a, gonna happen, you know, and then everybody just started going out there and all this debauchery was happening, <laughs> every the craziness, and nobody was working, so the tour kind of fell apart, and he got really mad at me and Stiv, and he had all this equipment that he had uh, bought, and I don't know if I should talk about all this stuff <laughs> before I get shot or something. <laughs> so when, when when was that then? That was late uh, 70s? Yeah. Yeah. We, we should maybe not do this, but, you know. All right. Um, okay. So, um... Because it, it was... It was 
just I, they, crazy. They, yeah, yeah. There's okay. and it's still people around, and it's just okay. Yeah. No problem. Um, so the the last version of the Dead Boys then um, that played um, before Cheetah or after Cheetah left the band when you joined the band and George. Joined, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was around what seventy nine eighty, right? Yeah, eighty, eighty seven, eighty. Yeah. So. Um, I was out in L.A. Yeah. in January of 1980 and saw the shows Looked, at the Whiskey. Oh, yeah, you were there when Belushi played. Oh, okay. and, and the Rubber City Rebels, yeah. which, um, as I was saying on the way down here, I was, I was telling Chris um, that I had to travel almost 3,000 miles across the country yeah, to, see. to see a show that I could have seen in my backyard yeah, three years earlier. Yeah. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that's right. So how did... How did it come about that John Belushi ended up on drums in that? Well, movie? they knew him from before, and he had played the Blitz Benefit and everything, and they had hung out with him in New York. But he was out in L.A. and came up, and, and he was backstage. So um, we did our, a set, and we would always do a, an encore of Sonic Readers where people are cheering for an encore. So he's backstage, and Stiff comes out, and he says, there's this guy been bugging us backstage, wants to come out and play drums, you know, so we're going to let him go. So we bring him up and of course you may he comes on the the uh, the drum riser and takes a bow everybody went crazy because he, he was the biggest star in the world at that time the animal house and mm -hmm. blues brothers so he played and people were going nuts and and at the end there's just screaming and stuff like that and so uh he jumps off the drum riser and walks right up to me on the stage he goes let me fuck up you know? <laughs> and i go no you sounded great actually you know the funny thing yeah. is is that I don't even remember yeah. that. Yeah. I was just so enthralled with the fact that I was in L.A., yeah. I was at the Whiskey yeah, yeah. A Go Go, and I was watching the Dead Boys and the Rubber City Rebels playing, and it didn't even <laughs> dawn on me that that was John Belushi yeah, on yeah. drums, and yeah. I found out years later yeah. that that was the case, and I've always wanted to know yeah, how did, that came yeah, about. He just came down and did the encore with us, and then we went up and partied up, up in the... Uh, uh, um, upstairs dressing room there and he went next door and played with muddy waters oh wow after so what a night huh yeah that you is know? pretty crazy so so did that series of shows did that lead toward the breakup of the band ultimately? no no we just kept touring we toured all the way through and all that spring and went all the way through the midwest out west again went back to the whiskey and did three nights and sold them all out two shows a night in may with david quentin on because blitz had left by then and then we played all summer, did the uh, Disconnected album in August and September. We were supposed to go to Australia then, and Stiff kind of blew that off and, and went over and joined the, the Wanderers and did that thing and, and uh, John Waters' movie, yeah. Right, right. So so the, um, the um, Disconnected band, the Dead Boys were still together when the Disconnected band yeah, I was a, kind of doing everything at one time, you know. And then we played the Starwood out there in L.A. when we did the Disconnected album. Then when Disconnected was released in December, we still went over to England in, in the fall, came back in December, and that's when we did the last tour. Brought Brian James with him, so that was fun. I like Brian a lot, a good guy. Yeah, yeah that, that Wanderers album, and, and um, we, we talked about it a little bit last night, and Cheetah thought that was really a brilliant album. Yeah, it yeah, really I like was an yeah. awesome record. Mm -hmm. And um, I um, saw that show. Mm -hmm. They played the mistake downstairs of the Agora. Yeah. And well, Blue Ash opened. It. Oh, really? Yeah. See, now I don't remember. I got, again, yeah, we, I was we, so enthralled with the I just, Wanderers. I, I had Jim and I got George Cabinets, Eddie Best, and, and, and Mikey Hammer. It was kind of a Blue Ash, but we did this Blue Ash. And we got together and did a few gigs, and we opened up. And I remember it was an odd thing because Todd Rundgren, Todd was, Rundgren was sitting was right there. in front of me. You know, when I was playing, I go, this is pretty good. We had just done an interview with Todd. Mm -hmm. um, Utopia had just played the Coliseum like a few weeks before that. Mm -hmm. And I was down there, and I'm watching the Wanderers, and I turn around. And there's Todd Rundgren yeah. standing right in front of me, and nobody recognized him. Yeah. I was the only person in the entire room that went up and talked to him and yeah. recognized him. I said, what are you doing here? Yeah. And he says, oh, I'm, we're playing down in Akron, and I just wanted to come up and see Yeah, I'm, I'm playing, and I'm looking right in front of me, right in front of me. I think, Todd Rundgren? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like standing right in front of me. 
Oh wow, that's that's pretty weird. Yeah, I man, it's cool. Yeah, it was that night. So so did the disconnected project was that always supposed to be something separate or was that that was always separate yeah. that was never to be wrapped into the dead boys no no and... no, no that was just the, for great shot to do an album okay um to recoup some of the money we had all spent at his so <laughs> <laughs> so as we know in 1979 power pop was mm -hmm. like really an, an in thing i call that the, 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 the summer of power pop yeah so. <laughs> the, the 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 whole the new wave thing summer. you know yeah. punk was on its way kind of in a sort of a stagnant mode at mm -hmm. that point because then now we had the Sex Pistols and all of the the angry punk mm -hmm. bands coming yeah. out of England and people were kind of saying well, we don't want that stuff mm -hmm. in America and so then you had the Blondies and the other mm -hmm. new wave bands that were coming out they were kind of power pop um, and um, how how did that influence the direction of what the Dead Boys were doing and with what um, with with what the disconnected band well, was doing. Well, I think with Jimmy Zero, he was always the the power pop guy. I always call him the Brian Jones of, of the Dead Voice. But he was always the, the fashion guy, the power pop guy. And I think he had a lot of a lot of influence on that too. And Stiv also was very very loved the power pop sound, and he always loved my band Blue Ass. So I think when I got in with them, we just started writing in in, in that kind of a vein, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I always think I, I won't look back, but the Dead Boys is one of the great power pop songs of all time. I even do it in my uh, uh, solo shows sometimes. You know, pull it up. But yeah, Jimmy was a great songwriter in, in that band. He always liked that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a natural fit that, that we went that way. And we got the striped coats and the, the Teddy Boy thing. So it's kind of more uh, mod thing then, you know? And Stiv was also really influenced by Garage oh, yeah, big music time. as yeah, well. And I, I'm sure yeah. that that was one of his. his more favorite types oh, yeah, of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a Nuggets guy, you know. He yeah, I mean, was. you know, they did tell Even me. way back when, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Cold Outside, yeah. you know, all of that stuff yeah. that was that they were doing at that time. That's really cool. Yeah, um, too much to dream, yeah. Do you, yeah, that's another another great one. Um, do you know much about the last tour with Brian James and how it came about that he ended up leaving? Uh, well, it, what happened? Stimple just wanted to... We had to do a, a tour for the disconnected, you know, and I talked, yes, we definitely got to do this for um, um, uh, Greg Shaw. So he said, well, I'll, I'll bring Brian over too. I said, that'd be great, you know. So we did that and just did the tour. And then what he actually wanted to do then was have two bands. He wanted to have us and the Wanderers, and neither us or the Wanderers wanted that, you know. So I said, I can't be in two bands. It's not gonna. That's not gonna work, Steve. It's you can't. You know, mm -hmm. in two different continents, it's just not gonna work. So then the Wanderers thing kind of petered up. And he would write me a lot. That they were gonna form this new band. And he kind of wanted me to come over to England, maybe play a second guitar on Lords of the New Church when they. It wasn't called that then, but they were gonna form this band. He had gotten in with Miles Copeland, but I didn't want to move. My my wife was an only child too. I didn't want to move her over to England, so. And I had already started with Jimmy and and um, uh, uh, Club, Club Wild. Wild. Yeah, and I thought Club Wild was a fantastic band. Yeah. Billy Sullivan and Jeff West from the Waldos and Baloney Heads and everything he was in before. But I wanted to keep that, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and other than, because it had been so helter-skelterish, you know, the trips to the desert and the Winnebago things. And I didn't want to live like that and take my wife over to live like that either. But it turned out really good for him and it was good for him over there. And it was good for me here with Club Wild. But I actually thought Club Wild was going to be very big and get signed, but that's the way the luck of the draw goes. Huh? Right, well, And yeah, I was already and, in that band with Jimmy, so... And and now you've released the Club Wow album and, yeah, and it's yeah, a brilliant yeah. piece of Cleveland musical history. Yeah, and, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And and will live on, you know, as as that. And that's so then really the, cool. Then there's a, on the Club Wow CD, there's... there's a, Club while playing at the Agora, and we're opening up for Lords of the Nature. So it all came kind of full circle, full circle there. Yeah. yeah, and we would do gigs if they'd come here. So, so, so after after the Dead Boys broke up and the Disconnected Band broke up, and Stiv um, and Tragana was mm -hmm. the only one that he took from the Wanderers yeah, yeah. and put together with the Lords. When he moved over to England, did you guys stay in close touch? Oh yeah, we were to get. Well, I always stayed in touch with him. Yeah. So throughout the whole yeah, 80s. I got letters all over the place. I'll have to pull them out someday. And read them again. Um, what? Um, 
talking about Stiv and his jokes and things like that. Um, what's what's your favorite Stiv prank? Because I'm sure that knowing him as long as you did, he must have pulled some real winners. My favorite uh, was the well, I think the funniest thing he ever did made me laugh hilariously, and Jimmy too, because he was there, but. Uh, the night we met the Stones at Keith Richards' birthday party, I told you earlier, Cheetah had Cheetah been in earlier wrist, and right. broke his wrist. So, so <laughs> Anita Pallenberg invited us over. So uh, it was at the Roxy, Roxy Roller Disco in um, New York City. So we get in the cab, meet Zero and Stiv. We we'll walk in, and, and Anita meets us at the door. She goes, Come on, up this way. And they had rented this whole Roxy, Ro Roxy Roller Disco for the party. And as we walk in, there's Keith and um, Ronnie Wood. Shaking his hand, Keith is the coolest guy in the world. Yes, it's always one of my heroes. We're talking. He goes, "You're Cheetah, did it?" And Jimmy goes, "What? What did he do?" He goes, "He really did." He goes, he "Fell and broke his wrist." He goes, "Roller skating is my driver took him to the hospital." <laughs> oh, Christ. So, so anyway, we go to the party and we're eating. And Keith's really hospital. Well, they had all this great food. We're eating the food, and they had a whole tub of um, imported beer, which we've never seen before. Just, you couldn't get that many imported beer. There was like Heineken back there, and Guinness maybe, and that was about it. They had all this stuff, so we started drinking the beers and everything, and ate the food. And um, Mick Jagger was there, and a big, big beard, you know, and you could, wouldn't even know it was him if you, because he was just in this guy's party in New York. And actually, that's the night uh, Keith met Patty Hanson too. When she was at that party, and there was all these Rasta guys and and uh, uh, Bobby Keys. And Mick's talking to one of the Rasta guys, I don't know if it was Peter Tosh or something, couldn't tell who it was. But they're in the middle of the room, and Mick's on roller skates, so he seems like real tall. He's like six foot four on these roller skates. And Stip's, you know, like five seven or whatever. So I see Stib inching over to him, and I just see her, I said, we better go with him, he's going to do something. We hadn't met Mick yet. So um, uh, Stib goes up to him from behind, taps him on the shoulder. And Mick turns around, the most condescending look I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and Peter says, where's the bathroom? <laughs> and I had to look away. And Mick goes, what? <laughs> he goes, I said, where's the bathroom at? <laughs> and it's kind of like silence with everybody around here. And Mick shakes his head and he goes, ah, don't go around the corner. <laughs> So we go in the bathroom, we just fall about laughing. I said, Christ, Peters, I said, I can't believe you fucking did this. And we're, we are, me and Jimmy have tears in our throat. It was one of the funniest, and even Stib knew how funny it was. It's just one of the funniest things I had ever seen in my life. You know? So even despite the beard, he knew that was Jagger. Oh, and yeah. He did it deliberately. Hey, he's just, he was, he was just, compl just to take the piss up. And, you know, Jagger was his hero. You right. know? And, but that's just the way Stib was. He had to do something that night, yeah? And we would never introduce them. You know, we talked to Keith and Mick uh, um, and uh, Ronnie Wood quite a bit, but we hadn't been introduced to, to Mick, you know? That was the introduction to Mick. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my funniest favorite. There's a lot of them, but that one takes the cake. Yeah, right? that's that's definitely a good one. Yeah. I mean, you know, the greatest <laughs> rock and roll band <laughs> yeah. in the world, right? And, and, and there here's this... Ask him where the snot kid coming up. Ask him where, the, ask bathroom him where the bathroom is. That's and, awesome. and Jagger kind of couldn't, didn't know if the piss was being taken up or if he even knew who he was. Or yeah, which is why I was just that's why he, was, he just didn't know. Yeah, and it was the the, the perfect piss stop. Yeah, uh -huh. and just spaders fucking around. Yeah. And so um, were were the stones like hip to oh, what was yeah, going on yeah. at that time? Yeah. Then, the funny thing is, we we would never. Jimmy and I, we could never tell that story because everybody would think we were full of shit, you know? Uh -huh. But then when Keith's book came out, it's like on one page, she, he was, oh, Anita was always bringing interesting people around like the dead boys. So there it was. Then Keith finally, yeah, so yeah, we tell the story now. <laughs> yeah, I had, heard, in, I had heard a long time ago about this party, and, uh -huh. and I'm sitting here thinking, it's like, wow, you guys had a 
Keith Richards' birthday party? Yeah. On roller skates? Yeah. And it's like, what? This yeah. is crazy. Yeah. And I couldn't figure, I yeah, couldn't we didn't picture. Put in, we didn't put the roller skates on. The, we would have broken our necks probably. But I it, couldn't picture Keith on skates. And no, I mentioned Keith, that to, no, Keith didn't have skates. Yeah, I mentioned that to Cheetah last night, and that's what he said. He yeah. said, no, I, he said, I was on skates. And he says, I was probably drunk off my ass that night. And just yeah. one leg went this way, and the other yeah. leg yeah. went that way. Yeah. And I went down and Yeah, Keith broke wasn't my on skates, fall, but Mick and, was. Mick was, yeah. And, and, and Marlon was there, the young <laughs> It was a crazy party. It was actually surrealistic. You, you walk in there, and, and, and Keith is like the coolest guy in the world. He just was, you know? Yeah. I've always said that out of all the rock stars, never the only two people that fame never really affected, and they were always themselves, was Keith Richards and Paul McCartney. Everybody else got screwed up. <laughs> Dylan <laughs> Lennon, you know, Pete Towns, blah, you know? Right. But those two were always just the the coolest guys and to this day still are they just it doesn't affect them yeah you know? that's great yeah so so obviously knowing stiff for so long the two of you were real close you know all the touring together and all the playing together and everything else you were one of the first people that agreed to do the benefit that i held for his parents yeah, sure. in 1990 oh, yeah, yeah. and i'm really grateful for oh, that yeah. i wanted to thank that was you. that was a good night yeah I, I wanted to thank you publicly for yeah. that as well um so, um, and then the documentary benefit that we just held this mm -hmm. past year, yeah, yeah, and you did that, and I wanted to thank you oh, for that you're too. Welcome. That was I'm also glad very to do cool. it. You know, I loved Stib's family. I loved his mom and dad and him, and I'm glad to help out anyway. Yeah. yeah, and that was that was really great. So, um, so after the final breakup of the Dead Boys, um, then you got together and did the Club Wow thing, and that was around '82. How long did that last? Club Wild went from um, 1982 to 1985, and we, you know, we played one or two gigs a, a, a month, either around Cleveland, Akron, or Youngstown, or Buffalo, and then we, we were mainly trying to get uh, um, a recording contract. We finally got had lots of uh, demos done, and we had a lot of labels interested in this. We went to New York and did a, a, a showcase at Tracks, I think. And had a bunch of labels done, but no one signed us. Yeah, and it was just we just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, probably. And then they kind of just petered out after that. Everybody was, uh, you know, just I, fed up with yeah. it. Because I was going to say, yeah, you know, like with all that tired. star power yeah. in the band, you'd think that it would have the popularity that yeah, it would keep I, going. Yeah, I, I would have thought so too. But, but uh, you know, at least we have those recordings, and we all still remain great friends. Billy Sullivan needed to play out and make more money, so he was playing out with different bands. Jeff moved to New York to run all the uh, Ultrasound Studios, you know, which he's still up there now for the city, but he's coming back to Cleveland. So, uh, and then, you know, uh, Jimmy and I, we just kind of dr dr drifted apart, and uh, then they had the couple dead boys reunions after that, when the influence went on tour with him. But, yeah, I never, never played with them again. So you did do a single, The Prettiest Girl mm -hmm. and The Nights Are So Long. Yes. Um, how did that do did that do but, fairly well uh, that, that real that was just like a local release and everything uh that was actually done before i was in the band you know okay. that was done at kirk pianos and and bob here and kirk maybe produced that and uh yeah and they had just put that out as, as i joined the band okay yeah. was was jimmy working on the lesbian maker thing at that time or did no that no come, that, that, was, that, came that was after, after that was after, after yeah, the club yeah. Yeah, broke yeah, up that was a good band too he had good stuff with that so um was was there much talk, or was there any talk of a reunion when you put out the Club Wild album? Uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're still talking about it. It still might happen one of these days. You know, if we can get everybody together and do it, maybe we'll do a, you know, Cleveland, Akron, Young stuff, and maybe a New York thing too. Because I don't think would, Billy's be in town right now. Is yeah, he? yeah, he's coming. Oh, well, he's coming. I know in November too. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of November, um, the Dead Boys are doing a show at the Rock Hall. Oh, okay. um, at the Rock Hall Archives oh, okay. on November fourth. Oh, that's cool. So that'll yeah. be that'll be a really cool yeah, thing. That's nice. And, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I guess they're really excited about. Oh, that's real that cool. Too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that's great. Um, I'm I'm guessing. Uh, well, you said in the liner notes on the CD um, that Club Wow was one of the favorite bands that you yeah, ever played. Club in. Wow was a great band. Everybody in that band could really, really play. Mm -hmm. I mean, the timing was perfect. Great singers, you know. It was, you know, I, I only sang lead on one or two songs. That's how good the singers were. In that. Great personalities. Yeah, 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 great everybody personality. gelled yep, together. Yeah, yeah, 
That's, that's oh, we never had a bad word with each other. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. Everybody was good. So, so how did you get involved with the infidels and in producing their stuff? Well, I I I was um, uh, manager of National Record Mart up here in the mall, and this is about 1982 or 83, and uh, it, it's the weirdest thing about you know most guys that are in bands and when, when you need money and you usually end up working in a music store or a record <laughs> store yeah so, so i was gotta I, stay and, close to the music yeah, right <laughs> yeah I, was, I had just started with club wow and i was a manager up, up at the record mart and these two scruffy look looking punks come in and plop a, 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 a disconnected album down and 10 bucks you know and it's john lumick and pete rear they are from from the debbie codes down on pete owns the studio and I said, you guys got to be some kind of sickos to buy crap like this. Yeah? You know? Oh, man, Steve's great. They're, 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 they're real upset that I'm fucking, uh, it's a shit. I said, oh, Steve's great. I said, turn the record over. Say, turn on, that's me. Yeah. I said, look at it, look at it. <laughs> How you doing? So, hey, we got a band. You want to come down here? I said, I said oh, geez, okay. You know? So they talked me to come down here. I said they had covered the last year that Stiv had died, and they were about 17 or 18, and, and they were not not that good, but they thought they were great, you know. But they had a real good attitude. So I told, I said, so let's see what I could do. So my friend Jeff Jones was managed bands and everything. He was managing Club Wild too. So I said these kids, I said, I said that they got a real good attitude, charismatic kids, smart asses. I said, just picture, you know. A, Stiv Vader's, Jim Kins, or Frank Sussage when they were 17. And that's <laughs> all of them. Yeah. He goes, Oh, should we manage them? And I said, Yeah, we should do it. So that's, I got them recorded, and then now, you know. That was the 30, four, the 4 by 20 album? Yeah, all that stuff. And then, uh, 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 yeah. What was it? Four. Intervals, times four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, now I'm in the band with them, Debbie Bones. <laughs> so funny how life works, you know? And the disconnected albums started it all. That, so you, but you never actually played with them as the end. No, no, I was just, their manager. I played on some of the records and stuff, and wrote a song or two. So uh, okay. Um, so all right, let's bring it up to today, and okay. let's talk about the Deadbeat Poets and and how that whole thing came about, because that's another really great power pop, punky, garagey kind of band. Well, in, in two thousand five, um, Bomp Records got a hold of me. Susie Shaw, they were going to do a tribute to Greg Shaw after he had passed away. I wouldn't know if I could get a bunch of Ohio people to um, play on it and do a song for this tribute album. So I, I got Dave Swanson and um, uh, Billy Sullivan. I got called one or two of the Rebels, but they couldn't make it. And uh, Blue Ash guys, Bill Bartolin and myself, Infidels, and uh, uh, we all we all got together and, 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 and played over at Pete's studio and did Him or Me, the Paul Revere and Raiders song. And I thought, wow, this, and I produced it and I said, this sounds so good. I, I said, if I ever get a band together, this is what I want to do, and I was starting to write songs again. I had quit, quit for you know from 1990 to 2004. I had never even picked up a guitar. I had just quit playing. And uh, I, after Steve died, yeah, I imagine Stiv, it took the wind out of the sails. And four days later, my other best friend, uh, uh, Beaver Warner, Mark Warner, uh, blew his brains out. And so I lost two two within a week. And uh, I was just I had had it with music. I had a three-year-old son, and I thought, well, I'm just gonna let it go and um, never did play so um, uh, 13 years later I pick up my guitar one day and I play this really really great riff and I hadn't touched the guitar 13 year old strings on it yet <laughs> and so I wrote the Stiv Bader's Ghost Tour song right on the spot about 20 minutes and then I went over and talked to Pete and recorded it just acoustically and, and another friend of mine Tom Saylor let me come over and record some stuff so I had about a half dozen songs so anyway, back to the, the thing for Bomb, uh, I said, if I ever get a band together, I'd like to do this. So I uh, started thinking about it, and then uh, um, I said, if I do get a band, I'll get Terry Hartman in it, you know, a friend. Well, he had disappeared just like me, but his son had been recording over at Pete's, so uh, we got together with Terry, and I said, you know, let's come and record some stuff, and we recorded a couple songs, sounded great, and um, uh, I had sent my, my demos and everything out to different people. And uh, sent him the bomb, and uh, uh, Patrick Bussell, who's there now, runs uh, Alive Records and Bomb with Susie. He goes, I can't do anything with this. It's not the kind of thing I'm using, but I know this label over in Japan. They go crazy over this vivid sound. So I sent a uh, couple of uh, uh, MP3s out, and 
12 hours later, they offered me a recording contract. So, <laughs> after all those years trying to get stuff, it takes mm -hmm. that easy, I get another one. So, we just started recording. They sent us in advance, recorded the first album, and we're all working on our ninth album now. Ninth album? Yeah, ninth, ninth Bibby Poets album. Wow! So, so, that's how that all started. And Terry left the band a couple years ago. In 2015, we got John Lumick then from uh, uh, The Infidels. So, uh, he's a great songwriter. So, we're working and working. I keep, we've toured Europe three times. Um, They're real popular over there. Does that translate into similar popularity here in the States? No, or is it not, just not a regional share, but, thing? But we have a popularity in the States for another reason. It's because of Little Steven. He, you know, we've had underground three, three call of songs on the inter, Underground Garage, and that has like 5 million listeners a week. It's on 300 stations syndicated. And then we're on Sirius Radio. And they play us every day on there, mm -hmm. on that thing. So people know who the Dead Blue Poets are. So, it's been so what's the new Blue Ash stuff like? Is it like the Poets, or is it more like... Blue Ash, is there a distinction? It, 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 it's, it's like Blue Ash with the poets backing them up. <laughs> I'll play you a couple things. We'll go in. They're just rough cuts, but I think you'll get the idea when we go back in. It's kind of pretty cool. Okay. And lastly, um, tell us about the tour with the Roomful of Strangers. Um, since they're based out of Florida, yeah. how did you hook up with them? Well, and... Mick, Mick, Mick McLuhan, who, who's the lead singer, he's originally from Youngstown. Okay. So he'd be back here visiting his mom and everything, and he came to see me at the, at the, uh, the Debbie Poets at um, Cedars. And we, we became friends, and he goes, you know, I, I have this, you know, run this company, Bread and Circuses, and uh, we book bands, and we do this, I have the band, and all. He's, he's in all kind of things, they produce things, his whole company and stuff. Stuff. So um, I've done like three tours with them. I go out and acoustically for my book. I play an acoustic set. Then I get up and do Johnny Sincere and the Skip Bader's Ghost Tour and a few other ones. They've just recorded that and they're putting that out as a single, the Bader's Ghost Tour. They do a great job on it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I was going to mention that the the yeah. whole thing about and and that's uh, since you mentioned that you you know do mm -hmm. the, the yeah. solo thing ahead of time. Um, one of the cool things I think when you do your solo material. Um, acoustically like that, you always tell the story oh, yeah. of how the song was oh, yeah, was yeah, made, yeah. and it seems like just about every song has to do with somebody or something that crossed your path yeah, at some yeah, point usually. during your life, and I think that's a really cool way to approach oh, it. Cause oh, thanks. I always, I always, I always take the approach toward music. If if you can write something that's true to you, you, you know it. It, it'll it'll transfer that way, but a lot of times, as as a writer, it's hard to see the things that are right in front of your face. Mm -hmm. And when you can see the things that are in front of your face, like people you know or things like that, and it, it, it's been there all the time. Like I wrote a song called Jenny Bird Hill. I'll take it back, and people really like one of the most popular things. But I would drive past it every day of my life and never think about it. And all of a sudden, it hit me one day. All the memories of that place, yeah. It's just how I work. <laughs> and and stories about all of that stuff can be found in Circumstantial Evidence. Circumstantial Evidence, my book. From yes. High Voltage uh, Publishing out of Australia. Uh, you can get it at um, bookstores everywhere. But, but the best places to get them, because a lot of them are autographed and things like that, if you're into that, or uh, Get Hip out of Pittsburgh. And uh, That shows, obviously. It, yeah, yeah. And and Bomb, Bomb carries them, of course, and have them. So that's that's great. Good, good sales. Yeah, good sales. Steady sales. It just keeps going and going and going, which is nice, you know. Is there going to be another pressing or another uh, publication run? Um, I'm talking to people right now in Spain about doing it in Spanish, and maybe using different pictures and stuff because I have all those pictures that mm -hmm. those girls gave me. So maybe there'll be a Spanish version. I have a lot of fans in in uh, Mexico and South America, and especially in Spain. So it'll be. Why do you think you're so big in the Latin countries? I have no idea. <laughs> and they're so cool, too, you know? I'm walking down the street, and one guy goes, Frank Sausage. Gives me a big hug down the street in Madrid. You are the master of the world. And I'm thinking, where is this? <laughs> <laughs> Just walking down the street. But that's how crazy it is. And we would be playing, you play on a Tuesday night, and there's 400 people in the club, and everybody's singing Blue Ash songs. This is, this is nuts. <laughs>
<laughs> you know? Yeah. And you just see everybody mopping. You know, it's plain to see. <laughs> and, and, and to bring it full circle, one of your Spanish friends turned you on to this Venezuelan yeah, I, version of a blue yeah, ash I, I had never seen it before, and I was looked, I just check every once in a while to see things rotten. And, and I look on Discogs, and it says Venezuela pressing. And it has pictures of it, and the label, and it's in Spanish and everything. Wow, so I put it up, and the guy goes, I have that. That's where I first heard Blue Ash, and I saw it. I'll send him an English version. He says, I'll send it to you. If you guys just send me an English one. I said, great. <laughs> Never knew it was in Venezuela. <laughs> it's just things like it. Just You don't know, you know? Yeah, and it always just makes it so great when you find oh, it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just there, there, somebody at some company there yeah, licensed it from CBS or Playboy and, or were part of their umbrella or something. They just put it out. You, you just never know. Always nice to know you're more popular than you ever thought you were. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and, and, and you, you know, I mean, I, I still get, I'll get calls you know, in the middle of the night that I'm so and so from Brisbane, Australia. How did you get that guitar sound? <laughs> I go, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I, I like it. I dig it though. It's fun. I mean, what, what can you ask for? You know. Yes. That's yeah, that's more, great. Yeah, it's just fun that people still think so much of it, especially the disconnected. I might get more mail and emails and stuff like that every day. But I spend two hours a day just answering, you know, emails, messages on people. So a lot of fans like to talk. I'll talk to them. Yeah, that's great. It it's was a, always like that. He never forgot anyone's name. Right. He was, you know, he was. Yeah. He never did. He would forget a name, face. Yeah. So that's great, and and you know it's like it's quality material. It keeps going. Mm -hmm. It'll keep you going. You keep going. Yeah, I'm 66 years old now. I can't complain. Yeah. And that's yeah. <laughs> what more can be said. Yeah. Frank, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Appreciate. Thanks.